So this is where we left off. So, <coughs> or <coughs> the element before. So we saw that with boron, we had four electrons, two of them in the first energy level, two of them in the second energy level. And when we went to do the <coughs> graph, we saw that the graph had two peaks, equal heights, because there's equal numbers of electrons that have those have the energies. So this represents our first energy level electrons. This represents our second energy level electrons. Because there are two in both instances, these have the same height. Okay? Now at the very end of class last time, we had started boron. Did I show you what it should have been, or did yeah. I? Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> last time in class, so we had our boron. We have two electrons in the first energy level. We have three electrons in the second energy level. And for the most part, what people had done was something like that, where you had this peak representing the first energy level and this peak representing the second energy level. And we had this peak taller because there were three electrons in the second energy level. That's what you would predict based on the evidence that you had up to this point. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so, <coughs> what it really is is this. This peak here represents the first energy level. Both of these peaks represent the second energy level. Now, I've made the change, and I don't know if you've noticed it, I've made the change to saying energy levels. What have we been calling them? Shells. shells. Because a shell implies that, and it's, it's the model that you had learned in middle school, where you've got the electrons are on a little circle orbiting around the nucleus. Okay, so it was a shell. The electrons existed on a shell. We can still use that term, but we've got to expand its definition a little bit. So, with our, with our five protons in our first energy level, I'm going to draw this a little better than I did first or sixth period. So, in our first energy level, I'm going to represent it like that, not as a line. The line, line seems to imply it's got a specific path. Here we've got a little bit of range, okay? But in the first energy level, that range is pretty small, so it looks to us as if it's a shell. And when we look at these electrons, actually somebody asked about this in my period uh, 10 class. Why does it spread out at the bottom and is narrow at the top? Because there is a slight range. If I do look at the first ionization energy, I'm going to get a little bit of a range there because the electrons are not stuck at one specific distance. There's a little bit of fuzziness to it. It's an average distance. Okay. When we get to the second energy level, that changes a little bit more. The second energy level, again, moving away from that shell idea, is more along the lines of you got 
a larger range of values. Now in this case, that larger range of values for us within this energy level, there seems to be two very distinct energies. So why is this not a third energy level? Anybody got an idea? Logan? They're too close together for it to be a third energy level. That's it. The, the difference in energy is not big enough. Yes, there's a difference in energy. But the difference in energy is not like the distance or the difference between these. This is a first energy level. This is definitely different, significantly different. The difference in energy between these two is not enough to say it's in another shell that's much further away. What we're saying here is that we're going to call it an energy, energy level. And within this energy level, there's two different distances that the electrons are away from the nucleus but similar enough to be still called a second energy level. Any questions about that? The tool, is it going okay? It was really hard to get it over first. Okay. And I realized why you were giving it a stop. Yeah, because it hurts. <coughs> okay. Ready to move on? So I'm going to let you read through this because it's basically what I've just said, all right? Does anybody have any question about what this is? Lincoln? I guess I'm just still confused why there is three for beryllium, but not for, like, lithium. So, okay. So with lithium, this was a little bit simpler in the sense that <coughs> we've already seen, we've got evidence for that third energy level. Okay? Or, I'm sorry, second energy level. And we know that because if we look at the ionization energy, it, and we did this back when we were introducing, you know, why do we go to a second shell rather than just have a third electron in the first energy level or the first shell, was that the first ionization energy for lithium, meaning how much energy it takes to remove that electron, is significantly less than what it was for helium. Now, helium would have a plus two with only two electrons in it. So the only way for that to happen, where you get an increased number of protons, but you get a significant drop in how much energy it takes to remove the electron, is to have that next electron further away. With me so far? Yeah, that makes sense. I just don't get the graphs at all. Okay, oh. so <coughs> with lithium, three electrons. Both of the electrons in the first energy level require, if you were to only remove one electron, that was it, just one electron. Both electrons in the first energy level would look the same because they're both essentially the same distance away from the nucleus, and the nucleus is still plus two. So if we're looking at the equation <coughs> So if we're looking at that equation, 
what we're doing with the, the, the first two electrons is they would be, both of them a negative one, both of them would be a plus two, and both of them would have the same distance. Now, because there's two of them, that means that this peak should be higher than this one. Because we've got twice as many. Now, <coughs> the lithium, the, the third electron, being in the second energy level now, this distance has gone up. So if this goes up, remember our magnitude for the attraction is going to go down. So we get a, we get a big drop in the ionization energy for that third electron. And we see that in our graph as a significant difference. And remember, going this direction is less energy, less ionization energy. That's more ionization energy. So <laughs> this is further to the right because it requires less energy to remove it. It's only half as high because there's only one represented. Okay, so is it like every peak that, do all the peaks have to be the same height or less as the first one? Like no, no. We'll see why. Okay. Okay. What I, what I will, what I will tell you, is that most of the time, if we add a peak, it's going over here. Because that means that our electrons are further away from the nucleus. Okay? Does that help? Yeah. Does anybody else have questions? Yeah. So by range of energies, you mean so like the shell has a width, and like the farther it is to the outside, the less it would take? Correct. Is that because, why range because, of energy? Because if we're further away, yeah. it's going to require less energy to remove it. Okay. But in, so with the... I'm sorry, with the boron, that difference in energy is a relatively small difference compared to the difference between different energy levels. Okay? So, if peaks represent, like, uh, so why would, why would one not have two peaks? Why would one, you mean one energy level? Yeah, yeah. So within that energy level, there's going to be different distances away from the nucleus. So the peaks just represent the range? So the peak, <laughs> this individual peak represents the amount of energy it's going to take to remove, in this case, two electrons. Uh, well, two possible electrons. The peak is this tall compared to this one because this represents only one electron. This peak represents two electrons. So if I, I'm going to flip back to the boron. So these two electrons would have the same, would require the same amount of energy to remove them. Two, two of these three electrons, same thing. They would, two of these three electrons would require the same amount of energy to remove them. Because two of these electro, two of these three electrons are going to be a little bit closer to the nucleus than the third one. But that's why I kind of drew this. So if you think of it like, you got electrons that are close to the nucleus, but still part of this energy level. And then you have electrons that are out there, 
at the outer edge, they're a little bit further away, but not far enough away to say it's a new energy level. So two of the electrons would be represented by this distance being close. The third electron is being represented by an energy that's a little less, requires a little less ionization energy because it's a little bit further away. Only this tall because it's representing only one electron. So the height on these represents how many relative to each other, and the left to right is representing our energy with the left being high energy, the right being low energy. And when I say that, I'm talking about the ionization energy. How much energy does it take to remove that electron? So for, like, let's say it was carbon, would mm -hmm. it have Hang on to that question because that's the next element we do. Okay? So the, does the left side have need more energy or just the right side? The left side. So the further left it is, the more energy is required. <coughs> now, yeah, right? So how would you know from looking at that the one is a little far away from the other one? Oh, that's what you, you don't. Well, at least right now. So the way you guys were taught in, in, in middle school, and even into, you know, if you're a sophomore, probably in biology class in, in, in eighth or ninth grade, where, whenever you took it, you're still doing the circle thing, right? Really good circle. I know. Oh, that's a good circle. I don't, yeah, that was not a good thing. So we got our nucleus, right? And we got the electrons on there. And, because in up until today, your understanding was that you have two electrons in the first shell or energy level. And you have eight in the second shell or energy level. Some of you might have been taught that you have eight in the third energy level or shell. That's a lie. We'll correct that today. Okay? But <coughs> And we can still say that, but there's a little more refinement that we have to do. There are eight electrons in the second energy level, but it doesn't take the same amount of energy to remove all eight. Okay? Two of them are going to be different than the other six. That kind of ruins the surprise, but that's what it ends up being. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so in your notes, I would tell you you need to add these things because this is where our refinement and some of our terminology. We're going to start identifying these peaks. So we said this is the first energy level. Check. That's why it's a 1. But we give them letter designations as well. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but it had to do with these spectrums. Okay? And these spectrums are very idealized. If you went to the real world and did this, they would look nothing like this. There'd be a whole lot more data in these graphs. But what you would be able to do is pick out these, these peaks that would occur higher. So it's, this is idealized, <coughs> and in those, gra in those spectrums, in the graphs, they identified and labeled peaks with labels to help them find patterns. This is a 2P. So what this does is it distinguishes that there is different areas in the second energy level. One area we call S, one area we call P. 
I'm going to call them sublevels. There's other names it goes by, but that's probably the most common sublevel. So the number is going to tell us what energy level it is. So both of these are the second energy level, but this is what we call the S sublevel, and this is the P sublevel. If you think of it as an analogy, this school, the first floor of the school is split up into four sections. You've got the music, performing arts, we've got the science area, we've got early college, and then we've got publications. So we're all on the first floor, but we're sub areas of that. So within energy level, within in an atom, in the first energy level, that's it. It's just an S. But in the second energy level, we have two areas, the S and the P. Each one different in the amount of energy. Aiden, you have a question or you don't know? So is it for every atom where there is a second shell or energy level, will there always be two, two spikes? Yes. Every atom. No. So how would you determine how high the second one is? Let's try it. Let's see what you come up with, okay? <clears throat> made a distinction now. There's, <coughs> in carbon, there are four electrons in the second energy level. But we've already identified that two of them are going to be in a sublevel that we call S. We know that one of them is in a sublevel we call P. So I want you guys to try it. Draw what you what based on what you uh, how you understand it. I'm not people. I don't care if you get it wrong. I want you to try it. So if you get it wrong, then we can correct it. I mean, there's a reason why you get it wrong, and we can correct it. You learn from your mistakes. Too many of you are afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You can't learn from that if you don't make mistakes. <coughs> okay, so draw me a diagram. Let's see what you get.
Huh? I'm I'm practicing still. Yes. <laughs> I've still I still have a block with some people. Why I have no idea. something like this. <laughs> okay? What? Okay, so if, if we if we look at it as a pattern, we saw that in the previous one we had three peaks, right? Now, what I would tell you is that before you add any peaks, see if there's a pattern first. So Aiden, this kind of is answering your question. We want to look at, we want to look at a pattern and see, are we going to need to add any more peaks yet? Because right now, <coughs> we added a peak when we added a new energy level. And all of a sudden, we just saw this seemingly random one pop up. But we don't want to assume that they're just going to pop up after that. So that's why this. So go ahead and keep predicting. You build them as you go until we get the evidence that something's different, and then we adjust from there. Aiden? So why would the second peak for the two, why would that be the same height as the first? Because the height represents the relative number. We've got two in the first energy level. We had two from that two at second energy level S, and now we have two in the second energy level P. So, so Yes, yeah, so if you get the same number of electrons but different energy levels, they're going to be separated. They're going to be separated this way, but their heights will be the same if you have the same number of electrons. Allison? So, you said the point one is closer to the nucleus, right, by going this way? This one? Oh, I'm sorry, this one? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's this further away from the nucleus. Oh, so going this way? So, yeah. <coughs> so all of them, going this way, they require more energy to remove from the electron. I'm sorry, from the atom. Which means that everything that's further to the left is closer to the nucleus. Okay. All right? Yeah. So are you saying that one peak represents two electrons then? Yes. This one peak represents two, this peak, and this peak. They all represent two electrons. So does electrons. each peak, no matter what element it is, just represent two? No. No? Well, then how do you find They're that? relative to each other. Okay. 
so you just find the similarity mm -hmm. in each energy level? Right. Okay. Uh, so how do you know when the, like, the other level is like, like half? It's a good question. And actually, I remember last time, Cameron, you kind of spotted it. Look at the periodic table. Everybody's got one on your table, right? Yep. Maya, you got a question? Yeah, but it's hang on. All right. Hang on to it. So, we saw that we we're going to have to have a new peak when we get to a new row. Right? So, hydrogen had a peak, helium. <laughs> <coughs> had one peak, it was just twice as high. Why? Because there's twice as many electrons. When we got to lithium, we needed two peaks. One representing the electrons that are in the first energy level, there were two of them, and our second peak representing our first electron in the second energy level that we now know is called the 2s. Brilliant, two peaks. Now look at our periodic table. If I told you that all the answers are on the periodic table, I thought I mentioned it, but all the answers are on the periodic table. You just have to know how to interpret it. Boron, we get a new peak. What's different? Where is it located? Lincoln? Is it because it's on that one? Um, not exactly. Okay. I'm not saying it's not correct, but not exactly. Is this area of the table pretty distinct from that over there? Yeah. There's natural breaks in our periodic table. Those natural breaks occur where we get differences in what our ionization energy is. <coughs> so we went from boron to carbon. Is there a, are, are these in the same area? No new peak. A. So that's saying that boron and carbon have the same. Say again. No. They have the same number of peaks, but the heights would be different for this. So boron, it would be half as high, because it only has the one electron. Carbon's going to be twice as high as boron, or equal in height to the others, because this represents two, this represents two, and carbon has two in this what we call now P. Right? So you have to know like where the cutoffs are? Kind of, but they're right there in front of you. Okay. But here's, I know it's easy for me to say they're right there in front of you, but you're, you're, you, you'll start to see why. The more we do, you'll start to see why. And then we get to Maya. Maya, what was your question? How do you know that for the second energy level that there is two and two and not like three and two? <coughs> okay, good question. So this become more evident as we go along and do more. But the reason why these are designated S is because the S sublevel can only hold two electrons. Okay? Questions? Yeah. Kenzie? I forget if somebody asked, but will 
one sneak always represent two electrons? No. Their, the relative heights to each other will tell you. Okay. Now, so <clears throat> I just got done answering Maya's question about that the S always is rep always represents two maximum. Okay? I I don't want to go all the way back to the hydrogen, but if you look at if you go back in your note if you're doing this notes and notability. If you go back to, I can't remember if it's the, the slide with hydrogen and helium, they're, they're lined up, so, or they're matched up. And on the graph, I have the helium, and then I had the hydrogen. And the reason why they're different is because helium requires more energy to remove an electron, but the height of the helium was twice the height of hydrogen, because it has two electrons versus hydrogen's one. <coughs> so the peaks don't necessarily have to represent two. Okay? Other questions? All right. Do, what is that? Neon? Neon, yeah. Do neon. Gave you a hint about location, right? Let's see what you come up with. <laughs> okay. Now, 
The only thing I would ch have you change is that on yours, you're, you call it, is that, is that a P? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a D. Looks like a D. I would call it, it's two, yes. not six. Not, okay. Aiden? So, really, so if S can only have two, S can only pack out at two, with that second D, if there's eight electrons, would that just be the remaining amount of electrons that are left in the shell for that energy level? Yeah, because the second energy level holds eight, right? Yeah. And you know that the S can hold two. So, so the second D is just the remainder? Yep. And that's on the table. Look at the periodic table. Class, how many columns does this area have? Six. Six. So that's why. That's why on that. That's why you put the six. Right. Okay. So on that diagram. Diagram we've got up. The only thing that Nasser had, had incorrect was the the number he had labeled it as. The heights are representative because if you look at it carefully, the height of his tall one is three times the height of the other two. And what's and if the other two represent the S, the one S and the two S, how many electrons can the S hold? Two. Two electrons. If his third peak is three times as high, that means it has how many electrons? Six. And how many columns do we have here? Six. Six. Huh? Right? Um, so I know that like the bottom line I found this is ionization energy, but like how do you know where to put the peak? I'm not worried about that. Okay. So here, that's that's actually a good question because your your values that you have are all the same, okay? <coughs> so on yours, they all are start out point 0.1, they end at 10 over there. Well, that's changing drastically. Because if you look at mine, mine starts at point 0.1 and now it goes up to 1,000. I'm not concerned about the placement of yours other than do you have the relative idea of how they should be spaced. If they are in different energy levels, they need to be separated by a fairly wide amount. If they're part of the same energy level but different sub-levels, like the S and P in this case, they should be relatively close together compared to other energy levels themselves. Go ahead. One is why can the S only have two electrons? Math. Why? And what's your other question? And, um, <laughs> your other question can't be what was my other question? <laughs> if you think of it, let me know. Okay. All right. Now I want to address the first, my answer to her first question. How, how do we know that it can only hold two electrons? There's a whole set of mathematical equations. It's math. They developed a new type of calculus to be able to describe atoms. That's why I said it's math. It's in the math. There, there's calculations that tell you what the possibilities are. Way above, I don't even understand, way above our level. <coughs> Do sodium. Andrew? So we know how to know that S can only hold two, but do we know why S can hold two? Math. <laughs> okay. That, so, and, We'll talk about it really briefly. Okay. Kenzie, you think, think of your other question? Yeah, I was just going to ask what exactly like the S and P, like, I know 
Okay, so if you were to go, if you were to Google image a photoelectron spectrograph, you're going to get this really complex, messed up looking thing that has a whole bunch of peaks on it. That's why I said earlier, what we're dealing with is an, a very idealized version of it. But it to us, untrained in photoelectron spectroscopy, it would look like a bunch of gibberish. But if you were to start to look at and dig into and find, there's patterns in there. When you look at multiple elements, you're going to find patterns. And what the scientists did is they started naming or labeling peaks that they found patterns with. So the S, the P, the D, they have names associated with them. But other than that, they really were just, as far as I understand it, they were just labels assigned to specific peaks that repeated. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that repetition. We're seeing that we have a peak that's common, has a common height, that we're calling S, that is representing two electrons. It could represent one, but two max. Okay? Does that help? Did you ever have more than two peaks to water? Yeah. Andrew, you had a question? You can't draw. Oh, you can't. Crap. You didn't start it. You guys need it. All right. You got 20 seconds. What? No, Just do it. No. What? What, you, what were you doing? Wait. Do it. You're looking at it. Done. Two. Well, I know. So you should have it in your head as to how you do it. S's hold two electrons each, so that's two, the two S's, another two, that's four, and then our two P had six. That gives us our total of ten electrons. Sodium adds an electron. And as we saw earlier, when we get to the end here, we start anew. We need a new peak. Because we're now in this third energy level. How many electrons does, so the third energy level is going to start with S. And every energy level starts with S. <coughs> In every energy level, the S sublevel is always the closer sublevel to the nucleus. 
How many electrons are in that third energy level? Just the one. So in that diagram there, Maya is using the lines. You've got, well, in, in, you've got what, six lines. You got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. The only thing I would say is that the, the, the two P peaks should go all the way up. But you've got the idea. The two, one S and the two S are the same height. They, get, they represent two electrons. The two P represents six electrons. The three S represents only one. So it should be one half the height of the one and two S. Everybody okay? Now, <coughs> I took mine off because I have stacked both the neon and the sodium next to each other to show the relative to positions. Okay? So on mine, both of these peaks represent the 1s. The peak in blue represents the neon. The peak, the peak in red represents the sodium. Now, hopefully this makes sense in that neon has 10 protons, sodium has 11. So if I'm looking at the electrons in the first energy level, if I've got a plus 10, yeah, it's going to be hard to remove those electrons. But if I have a plus 11, it's going to be even harder, correct? So that's why it, this is shifted to the left. Remember, shifting to the left means it's higher energy to remove the electron because it's more strongly attracted to the nucleus. We see the same thing in a second energy level. The blue, this, <coughs> this is the 2s for both the neon and the sodium. The sodium is shifted further to the left because it's going to require more energy because it's got 11 protons versus the nuts 10. Both of these represent the 2p, same idea. The extra electron now that sodium has versus neon, that's in a new energy level. So we should see a significant change from our second energy level electrons and that this is going to be easier to remove. Everybody okay? And we call that 3s. We always start with s. Now look at the periodic table. We're going to talk about helium in a little bit, but lithium and beryllium, S. These represented P. Do where we hit next? S. I'm not going to have you do magnesium. But if you did magnesium, it would look like sodium, except the 3S would be what? One higher. One higher. I'm not going to have you do aluminum, but if you do look, did aluminum, you'd have 3s and with two electrons, and then you would have a new peak for what? 3p. I want you to do phosphorus. Okay? And I will get it to there this time. <laughs>
I know we didn't put three grand in gas. All right. Hit it. Hit it. I want to see what you got. Casey, Ryan, I'm looking at yours. I want to see yours. This is probably Still have another chance or two. All right. Does anybody have any questions about it? Yes. Does it matter where it goes, like on the bottom and how far apart it is? No. What, what I'm what I'm looking for from you guys is, do you get the basic idea of how they're grouped in space? So the ones that are the same energy level should be grouped together. Ones that are, you know, different energy levels, so different numbers, should be far apart. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so, class, if we look at the periodic table, these are representing the first energy level S, right? This is representing the second energy level S. This is representing the second energy level P. This is representing the second or third energy level S. That's why the peaks are the way they are. The first two going, going from left to right. The first one and the second one were the same height because they're both representing S. I'm looking at my imaginary one here. You guys look at it. <coughs> the third one went all the way to the top because it should be three times as tall. It's representing the P with six electrons. Then we have the 3S with two electrons. It should be the same height as the 1S and the 2S. And then we have the 3P, which should be a little bit higher than the 3S because it's got three electrons for the phosphorus. How do we know that? It's three over. Lincoln? Um, uh, so I thought like whenever we had a row shift or like a break, we added a P. So why isn't there four? Or I mean, why isn't there like We do. So after the three S, we added a, a peak for these that represent these six. Oh, okay. Yeah, never mind. So. <laughs> Questions? Get it figured out? Do argon. 
No, it's not. Okay, so the, now, Kylie, you asked about the, no, who asked about the placement left or right? Kylie, you did. Okay, so now I am a little. Since I've given you a reference point to start from, now I want you to pay attention to where you're drawing the piece left to right. So what I have on here, this, these represent phosphorus. You're going to draw argon. You're going to overlay argon on these. So I'm, I'm going to be a little more picky about the left-right arrangement as well as the height. So you've got a starting point. You've got things relative. <coughs> now make your drawing for argon on top of the graph for phosphorus. Okay. Okay, let's try and get him in. <coughs> Casey, Jonah, Lauren, Maggie, Nasser. Ryan, Ryland, hurry up. Good to me. Exactly. Because you have more protons and argon, it's going to be harder to remove every one of those electrons. So all of the peaks that were drawn should be drawn shifted to the left. Where to the left? I don't care. Just shift it to the left. Heights? The only one that's different is which one? 3P because the, the, this is phosphorus with three electrons, whereas argon has how many? In the 3P? In the 3P? Six. 
There's eight in the third energy level, but six of them are in the P sub level. Okay. Questions? Do calcium? So I think you're getting the you're getting the idea. Okay. Do scandium. Thank you. 
Okay. predictions we have something different we're making predictions based on what we have seen now the only problem I have with yours Ella is that how many electrons if we said can go in the S just two and you're putting a third in. okay now Plenty of people do what you did, though. Okay. <coughs> Most people are going to do something like what Logan did. Huh? Remember how I said all the answers are on the periodic table, right? Oh no. And something different happens, right? When you get to different breaks. We have a break here. This is different. You hadn't seen it before. Now we've seen it. Uh, I don't think anybody got. I, I'm not. I'm not going to go through and and dig through them all. <coughs> but here's what happens. So. So what happens here? Okay, so this is this is overlaid with the calcium. The blue is the calcium, the red is the scandium. Everybody all right? Yes. Now this is just scandium. This is our 1s. This is our 2s. This is our 2p. This is our 3s. This is our 3p. Everything's going normal, right? Yeah. Uh-oh. It's going to get shorter for p. This is our 4s. I knew it. And this is what we call, now this, here's the problem. For this to be further that way, what is the only possible way for that to happen? It has to be closer. Now, class, these electrons are in the fourth energy level. What's closer than the fourth energy level? And that's what this is. Whoa. It's in the third energy level. Is it three? In a new sublevel called D. That's the one thing you did have right, Logan. You did call it D. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> the class, 
the label I didn't necessarily, I, it is the placement for that I want you to, that helps us explain what we observe in nature. What are we observing? We're observing some patterns here. And like I said, all of the answers are on the periodic table. Absolutely. Already? What is the answer? Silicon. So, <coughs> we saw how these two columns right here, and I'll go ahead and stretch it on down. These two columns represent electrons in the X. Now, up here, there's nothing here, right? So that after the S came this, which is our P's. And all of these represent P's. Now I'm going to get to the question. What element looks out of place? Uh, helium. helium. Why? It's a noble gas. <laughs> well, you're right, it is a noble gas, and all these are noble gases, but why does helium look out of place? Adrian? It has one peak, but it's across the gap from the hydrogen. Yeah? Oh, look, it, you're right. Think about the electrons and how we label them. Aiden? Wouldn't it be labeled 1s and then 1p? Nope, it's just 1s. Because the first energy level only has S. Where are all of our S elements? Oh, left. left. They're over there. And there's a conspicuous space where helium would fit. Oh, because it's both. Well, <laughs> maybe you're, you're, you're right. So our periodic tables are set up and designed originally, and we still use them this way, based on the properties of the elements. The periodic table that looks like this, with some slight variations, because it was you know before a lot of discoveries were made, <coughs> but it looked very similar to this format, was developed 75 to 100 years before we even had a basic idea of these electrons. The development, the setup of the periodic table was set up before they knew about electrons. Now we're looking at the periodic table. I'm telling you, all the answers are on the periodic table for our electrons because there's patterns. Why? Because the element properties depend on how the electrons are arranged. All of the elements here in this group they all have one thing in common. They all have electrons arranged with their outermost electrons one or in, in the S sublevel with one electron. All of these <coughs> have two electrons in their S sublevel. Those two that arrangement gives the elements specific properties. We call these groups. They're also called families. Why? Because even though they are different elements from each other and have some different properties, they have many properties that are similar. I know some of you in here have had a brother or a sister, a sibling of some sort. Yes, sir. Okay. And. <coughs> You may look a little bit like a sibling, but you don't look exactly like them. You have similar characteristics. Because you're from the same family, right? That's why they call them families, because they have similar structures for their electrons. This is called the Ds. These are the D elements or D block. <coughs> and remember, I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned it a while back, that the third energy level doesn't hold eight electrons. The third energy level holds 18. This is the 3D, this row right here is 3D. 
And how many columns do I have in this? Multiple. Three. Ten? No, I'm thinking of what you're right. Four, two, three, four, five, six. The third energy level can hold 18 electrons. Two of those electrons are going to be located where? Four. Six of those electrons are going to be located where? <laughs> That's eight. And ten electrons are going to be located where? Eight. There you go. Okay. Lincoln? So do all the transition metals have the like beam? Yes. Mm -hmm. Questions? <coughs> so. Kenzie, this is where I got my answer for you earlier. Okay? And who else was that? So, last we left was Bohr, was about 1910. So we've got about, we're working on 14 to 20 years after Bohr came up with his model where the electrons are going in circles. Lots and lots and lots has been developed. Probably the biggest change was by the scientist named De Broglie. It's not De Broglie. It's De Broglie. Okay. And what what De Broglie said is that everything has properties of a wave. So remember, we talked about electrons being particles, right? Because that's what, how Einstein described it. But Einstein also understood that the electrons have properties of a wave. It has both. For those, of, for those of you who have read about this stuff, this is wave particle duality. I'm not going to get into the details of that. But suffice it to say that everything acts as a particle but also has properties of a wave. Now, the thing that scientists have discovered over time is that the smaller things get, the more wave-like they get. And electrons are pretty darn small. So a scientist by the name of Schrodinger, he developed an equation, a set of mathematical equations. This is the guy who they, this is where you developed a new calculus to be able to describe the atom. And he came up with a whole set of equations. Wait, I don't understand them, way beyond me. But those equations treated the electron as if it were a wave only, didn't treat it as if it was a particle, and described the energy that the electrons have. Now the thing about, so <coughs> this statement here is pretty important. We can't speak of the electron as having a specific location. We can't say it's located right here. We think of the electron as having what we call an area of probability. Where is it most likely? And that area of probability is a range of values, but it has a specific energy associated with it. If we were to think of it like the like school right now <coughs> during ninth period on white days when it's not lunchtime where is the highest probability of finding you here in this room are you guaranteed to be in this room though no you could be down in the bathroom you could run up the nurse it, it, it could be called down to the guidance office but if somebody was going to look for you, they would start here first. The next most likely location for you would probably be the bathroom. So <coughs> if we think of these things as a probability, the probability of finding you is this square block of a room you're more than likely going to be found someplace in this room. In fact, we could narrow it down even further in that you have a specific seat that's been assigned to you. Again, you're not guaranteed to be in that seat, but it sure does make contact tracing easier. Okay? 
if need be. <laughs> now, <coughs> Schrodinger's equations had three variables associated with them. First one is we call the, the principal quantum number, or which is the energy level. What energy level is the electron in? For us, that's easy. Okay. <coughs> the second was what we call the sub level. That's our S, P, D, and F. They're not the only sublevels, by the way. There's more. But we only need those four for the elements that we know. What's that? F? Oh, F is these elements down here. So if you look at a periodic table, if you look at a periodic table carefully, it goes 55, 56, 57, 72. Oh, wait a minute. We're missing a bunch, right? Well, 55, 56, 57, 58 through 71, these actually fit up here. Uh, quick note, this is called the short form periodic table. It fits in books in the eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper better. The long form periodic table would have this up here and it's spread out. So it would look like this, you'd have look like that. It doesn't fit on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper as easily because it's long. Hence the long form. Okay. Lincoln? Uh, is there a reason on that one the uh, whatever law is is included? The what? Like the LA up here in part of the bottom and over there it's They're all a little bit different in how they present those. Because their properties are a little bit weird when you get that far down. But there's a reason. All right, class. So um, I sent an email, and there's a message in uh, sent through Canvas as well. If you have an assignment, if you go into Canvas, I've rearranged Canvas completely to get all of those individual days into one in one module, so you don't have as much clutter. So in the unit two, should be near the top. There's one. Uh, I've got the lectures in there if you want to go back and look at them, or if you missed a day. <coughs> but there's a page that you need to read through that has some links to some videos and the assignment that I want you to put up. Okay. Have that for next time. It's Tuesday. Yeah, there's a there's a link for you to submit as well. Okay.